Hi there, welcome to Nomadic Diaries. We're the podcast that takes you on journeys through the lives of those who have already embraced the international lifestyles. Whether you're an expat, a digital nomad, or someone who's dreaming of those lifestyles, this is your passport to a world of insight. We dive deep into the hearts and minds of the overseas lifestyle professionals, the authors, and researchers. Join us in this fun adventure as we deconstruct all the elements of expat and nomadic lifestyles, one captivating story at a time. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Nomadic Diaries. And it is my extreme privilege and pleasure to talk to someone that I have wanted to talk to for a long time. Please meet Melissa Han. Hi, everybody. Great to be here. Let me tell you a little bit about Melissa before we get into our questions. Melissa is an intercultural specialist. She is a trainer and she's also an adjunct professor who is teaching people and schooling people on the intercultural skill sets. She is the author of a new book that came out just Oh, about a month ago, I think. Is that right, Melissa? Yes. And the book is called Forging Bonds in the Global Workforce. I would just like to start. Let's talk a little bit about the book. I think the words you used in the title are very evocative. Tell us about Forging Bonds and why is that different from some of the other language we hear when we're trying to be intercultural? Sure. So thank you again, Doreen. You know, when we hear the word forging, one of the images that comes to mind is, you know, maybe like a, a blacksmith, you know, they're, they're, you're creating something. And we wanted to emphasize that when you are trying to establish a connection with somebody that's really what you're doing. You're creating something together. And there's a kind of alchemy, right? You're, you're trying mm -hmm. to create something almost out of nothing. And you're doing it as you go. You know, you're not, yes. you don't go from having no relationship to having a relationship in a split second, but it's something that you are having to create. It's very active process. And the outcome is not predetermined. You can often make modifications as you go along. And so we really like this word forging because we think it really conveys the essence of what it means to connect across cultures. But we also wanted to emphasize that you know, with this word bonds, it's a sense that there's a tie. There's a link between you and mm. the other person. Not mm. all relationships are going to be your best friend forever. No. Not all relationships are going to be equally satisfying, but we wanted to get at the sense that there is, there is a something there. There's a sense of we, there's a sense of having a connection. And so we wanted to try to really convey those two things. You're creative, you're creating something. And what you're aiming for is that sense of knowing another person, at least to some degree. And that requires time, mm -hmm. energy, and attention, right? It does. And so we also wanted, you asked how this is different from other models. What we want to do is help people allocate those very limited time and attention resources in a way that's going to be maximally useful to them. One of the concerns that I have about the way that culture is often talked about is that the bar is raised so high that people can be turned off. They can feel that they have to get a PhD in the culture and they feel like they're memorizing flashcards and it feels very remote from their life and it feels very vast and unknowable. What we wanted to do is, is of course, respect the value in learning about other cultures, but we wanted to direct people's own energy and attention to simply getting to know the people that are in the spaces that they share. And we think that's actually all you can do anyway. None of us can truly master another culture, no matter how long we're there. We're still learning about our own cultures, in fact. So while we're, we're thinking about how we can grow and learn more, what we want to do is motivate and inspire people to find productive ways to spark and sustain initial connections, because we think that's a really practical, pragmatic area of focus. And I think for expats, that's a really good way for them to start, too. I would agree with that. I'm interested. I love the language that you're using about sparking and sustaining. I wonder if in this day and age with the media and the amount of information that we are all inundated with on a daily basis, do you think that it's harder nowadays to have the energy to spark? That's a really good question. I suppose it depends on the person and the environment that you're in. 
What I find challenging today compared to a couple of decades ago is that there's so much more information to sift through. You know, yes. before, you know, yeah. in the end of the previous century, <laughs> the problem might have been that you had no information at all if you were going to meet somebody for the first time from another yes. culture. Yes. Now, especially on social media, we are bombarded by messages about other cultures. And it can be really, really hard to connect the dots. And I think we can end up giving ourselves these kind of Herculean tasks before us to, to try to somehow connect all the dots in order to have a relationship. And what we want to do is, is really be respectful of that cognitive load and the emotional load, especially if you've just moved to a new cultural environment and say, you don't have to do it all at once. A spark can just be a, a tiny spark. Maybe it's just figuring out an effective way to greet everybody in the morning. Maybe it's figuring out what are the places where people tend to meet? Is it the lunchroom? Does everybody gather together to share a lunch? Or is it, is it afterwards at, say, the pub or at karaoke? Or in some cultures, the right place to make a connection might be on the weekend. A coworker might invite you to go to a museum with them or come to their, their child's birthday party. So figuring out the place can actually help you figure out where you want to try to fuel that little initial spark. And that sort of relates to where you want to belong as well, doesn't it? It does. <laughs> and, and you know, one of the other things I can share, Doreen, is that one of the big challenges that we see people facing when it comes to relationships across cultures is that it can be hard to feel like ourselves when we're in an environment that isn't our normal one. And it can be difficult to wrestle with the, the tension between authenticity and effectiveness. And there's not a formula, as you know, after living overseas for many years, there's not one simple formula that you can reliably follow, but there are some internal questions that you can ask yourself to help you gauge how much of your personality you want to show at any given time and how you can be receptive to other people's personalities so that you're really getting to know actual people and not just imagining everybody, including yourself as a generic kind of cut out of the culture that you think you come from. Yeah, I think that's a really super point to really drive home because I live in a city, as you know, in San Miguel de Allende, which is a very cultural mix. However, we have a very large population of uh, retired American Canadian expatriates here. And it is very similar to wake up every day and go to, you know, say pickleball and yoga or whatever your schedule is and meet the same people, still be speaking in English. And I find that taking the steps to move out of that and trying to develop local relationships is challenging. Mm -hmm. And I think that we get tired <laughs> and I th also think because, well, I speak for myself, I get lazy, I just get plum lazy. And so one of my missions with this podcast is, is to keep reminding us all that this takes work, this takes energy. Mm -hmm. But I love what you said about it being tiny actions and baby steps. So just finding where people are is a great way to start connecting and to figure out how we're feeling in the process. Really good information here. Now, I downloaded the book, Forging Bonds in the Global Workforce. It's on my uh, Audible. I have not finished reading it yet. But tell me, can you share an anecdote or an example from the book that really illustrates why it's important for us to try and build these cultural, these relationships? Sure. One of my favorite stories actually is about a Japanese company. And this Japanese company had a team that they had sent to the US. And after some period of months, the leaders were concerned because the Japanese group had really stuck to itself and had not really learned anything about American culture and, and was feeling very isolated. But there was one exception. There was one man on this team who was a photographer. And sort of on a lark, he had joined a local photography group in the United States. He had then used his, his own hobby, something he was genuinely interested in, as a way to connect with local people. So mm. he wasn't just trying to sort of stick himself in American culture at large and try to find his way from there, but he used his hobby, something he was passionate about, 
to connect with other people. Mm. And then because he was getting to know local people in a very comfortable, familiar, hobby-related atmosphere, he was then through those relationships able to pick up all kinds of valuable cultural insights that he then brought back to Mm. the office. And what we realized in talking to him is that it wasn't that he learned the culture first, and at some Mm. point he was then ready to reach out and connect with other people, but that the relationships themselves ended up being the vehicle for learning about the culture. And if you think of an infinity sign, it kind of put in place a beneficial process where he would learn and experiment and learn and experiment. But Mm. the way he started was in a way that was related to his own interest in his own comfort zone. So he started where he could and branched out as opposed to starting outward with the whole culture and then trying to make his own connection inside it. And I thought that was a really insightful thing that he did. Yes, I think that that's what most expats and nomads eventually come to that position, that it's easier to build relationships across interests. Mm -hmm. And I've seen that around here. People have advised me to do that. People have said, go find something that uh, stirs you or that you love to do. And so that is a really good example. And the Japanese culture for Japanese teams to be in the US, it it can be very isolating. So it's lovely when you find a community that loves what you love. So I say, follow your heart. (laughs) Exactly. And, you know, this is where we also differ from some of the current advice that you might hear in the intercultural world that emphasizes differences. And of course, you have to take differences into account. Differences do matter, but they aren't necessarily the raw material that you're going to use to forge that connection. They're present and you want to be mindful of them and respectful of them and and try to work with them. But if we were in our own cultures and I listed a series of things and then you listed your things and you were the exact opposite from me, that's not how we're going to connect. We're going to look for things that we have in common. And so we want to encourage people to use their own interests as a starting place. That makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Because then the more that we overlap each other and communicate with each other, and the more things we share that we're passionate about. So it really comes back to being global hearted, my favorite word. (laughs) So You talk a little bit about cultural intelligence, and I have to say we've had some experts on here in the last month or two, and suddenly this topic has just kind of been in my face and my listeners' ears. Do you have a different perspective on cultural intelligence from this perspective of building heartfelt experiences or in what ways it's similar in what ways is it different so i know that you might be familiar with david livermore i know that he has really developed this practice of cultural intelligence and we were actually really honored to have him read and even endorse our book so that leads me to believe that our approaches may be somewhat complementary um, yes. but to be very honest our focus is not so much on developing cultural intelligence as much as it is about developing an interpersonal relationship Mm -hmm. kind of method Mm -hmm. that is adaptable across cultures. So of course they overlap, but I would say that we are thinking in terms of what we call a spice blend. And if you think about a spice blend, there's lots of different elements in it, and you don't necessarily know which one is going to be drawn out the most. And we think about a person's national culture as being only one ingredient in that spice blend. And we think that that's really important because when we're working in global spaces, the kinds of people who volunteer to go into those global spaces are often not necessarily the prototypical version of their own home culture. If you're meeting somebody in Saudi Arabia who's (laughs) Chinese, but they went to an English boarding school, and then they've done extensive aid work in Latin America, but then they also got their PhD in New York City, (laughs) that's going to be a very different Chinese person than somebody who was born and raised in Beijing. So I think for us, it is more about an interpersonal kind of feeling out of the other person that allows them to present themselves to you with their kind of full variety and where you show up with the full spectrum of who you are as well, trusting that you can try to find a way forward 
together. And it, it doesn't necessarily always work, but we don't hit it off with everybody within our own cultures either. So tell me what's in the spice blend? So for each person, it would really be different. But we we obviously would include national culture. Uh-huh. Um, coming from the US and, and many other countries like India, I mentioned China, there's often significant regional variations. Uh-huh. You know, we could think about our gender, we could think about our generation, all the things that have shaped us. Um, we may have an, an ethnic culture, a religious culture that is very influential, and it might not be apparent on the surface. The kind of academic background that we have, you know, if we are a very kind of scholarly person, and if that is in a particular discipline, if you meet an accountant, for example, or a psychologist, or a teacher, or a realtor, <laughs> these people are going to have very different kind of styles professionally and, and in terms of what they've studied. And so what we're wanting to do is kind of keep national culture in perspective as mm-hmm. one element that may be really pronounced and mm-hmm. really obvious, or maybe in the background, depending on the, the context. One example that we have is of a German auto company that was based in the US. So you might think the most important cultural differences would be German versus American. But actually, when they were working on a project, some of the biggest differences that they found were between the sales and marketing team, the operations Mm -hmm. team, the actual factory, Mm -hmm. you know, all the different ways they were approaching their Mm -hmm. work. So what we want to do is not immediately assume that national culture is going to be the only variable that matters and and really get hyper focused Mm -hmm. on that. But realize, especially for expats, that when we're in these mixed, diverse environments together, there may be all kinds of surprises beneath the surface that we might not necessarily be expecting just based on the passport that somebody has. Yes, because I think we're finding more and more that most of us are in this soup called the nomadic or the expatriate lifestyle living in a country that is not your own are composed of more than one spice. I mean, one item. I'm Scottish. I do have an American passport, but I wasn't very good at being one. And I am more at home in what I would say was a messy environment in a culture that I don't always understand. And I I don't fully understand the language, but I swim better. And I and I know what you mean. And I, I think that, you know, sometimes what I also see is that the most relevant cultural gap is is actually not between countries per se, but between people who embrace all of the, the cultural differences around the world and people who have never left. You know, mm, it's just a very yes, different approach yes. to life, a very different worldview, yes. a very different level of comfort with yes. ambiguity. Yes. But for you, it sounds like an embrace of that ambiguity. <laughs> so that may be more relevant. It's not to say that Scotland and Mexico are the same. Of course, they're not. But if I were to try to get to know you purely as what I thought a Scottish person would be like, and you were, you knew that I was in Los Angeles and you tried to really figure out, okay, how should I talk to Melissa because she's in Los Angeles? Yes. We may, we may miss the mark entirely. Absolutely. So sometimes we let the nationality take up more of our thinking than it should. I think so, especially in expat and global work environments where there's so much mixing and mingling that we really can't put people in these tidy boxes anymore. And so can you give our communities maybe uh, two or three tips for our listeners as to how to break down this puzzle and build the just something simple that we can put in the heart of this episode? So let's see. One of the things I would say is to try Try to just get started. And I know that doesn't sound like advice because how do you do that? Well, one of the things that we recommend doing is using your own environment as a source of inspiration for prompting these initial connections. If you are in a situation where you're going to the same playground every day with your children, your environment that's available to you might be that community park, it might be the other parents who are out with their kids. And so then you might have conversations about that. Or maybe you just wave and you smile if you don't speak the language yet. But you look for what is the very simplest step that I can take. If I'm in a global team context and I'm I'm in a virtual workspace that maybe doesn't have an an actual connection to the, the physical location where I am, the things that we talk about might be different. But What I would recommend doing is using your environment, your immediate environment, as a source of commonality because you're both there. That's what you can both see. You can comment Mm -hmm. on 
the weather mm-hmm. or on the, the cute dog that's playing in the in the bushes next to the playground. Using those small things, I think, is a way to get started. You can also try to build on those initial connections. You know, we're often waiting for other people to take the next step. But sometimes asking maybe the other parent in this example, if they want to get some coffee or bringing a coffee to the park, maybe, Mm -hmm. you know, every day you see the same other parents, maybe you plan ahead and you bring a snack to share. You're not always going to hit the mark. It's hard to know exactly how any particular effort is going to work out. But referencing the environment that you have in common and then demonstrating your desire to connect with them by sharing something or by having an invitation is a signal to them that you'd like the connection to grow. Again, not everybody will be receptive, but if you continue to try, you're likely to find one or two people who you can foster those relationships with. And that, I think, is the essence of making life welcome. In so many arenas, sometimes, especially in the elder expat communities, I think we have the sense that maybe our energy is limited. But if we can stay open and welcoming to people, places, and situations, like you're saying, share things, invite people. These are all things that we can do. These are not out of our reach. It's it's very, very possible. So this is really helpful when we're feeling intimidated about crossing a culture. But how do we develop our confidence in this arena? I still go to my next door neighbor and say, uh, you know, He's my cultural mentor, of course, so everyone who's listened to me knows that I have a cultural mentor, and his name is Hugo, and my dad's name was Hugh, and I just think there was just sort of a cosmic joke about that, because he does give me that sense of uh, comfort when I talk to him, so that's just an idea of one way to do it, but how else can we build our confidence in this arena when we're very uncertain? I love that story about you having a cultural mentor that shares your dad's name, that is is just perfect. Um, I was going to say, you know, having a cultural mentor is is a really important way to get feedback. So after you're trying to spark these connections, having somebody that you can check in with, that person, it's not so much they're going to just tell you if you did it right or wrong, but they're going to give you new insights and new angles and new dimensions so that you can then feel like you have more range of motion in the next experience. But one thing I would say to people is that there's actually no reason you would be good at this. And there's no reason that if you spent most of your life in one culture and you go to another, that you would feel prepared to engage in a totally new set of rules. So imagine if you spent your whole life playing checkers, and now you've gone to a new environment and you're playing chess. There's some overlap, but there's a whole new set of, of rules and you're you're going to feel awkward. So I would advise that people embrace the awkwardness, not as a sign that everything is going poorly and that you're not good at it, but that maybe you don't feel good at it yet. And that mm-hmm. the people around you, depending on which culture you've moved to, it may be more or less visibly obvious that you have no way of knowing what you're doing. And I think... Mm-hmm. People are also often more forgiving of us than we assume that they'll be if they sense a good attitude from us and a willingness to learn and an effort. You know, there is this woman, relationships can be at different levels. And and there was this woman when I lived in Poland who had a small roadside stand and she was selling fresh pickles, these really large pickled cucumbers. And I went to her and I tried to buy one and I didn't say it quite right. But by making the effort to say it and kind of using what we call in the book, a language of of trust, I was demonstrating to her, okay, I'm going for it. I'm trying. Yes. yes. I I butchered it. (laughs) And she corrected me and she said it very slowly. The next time when I walked by, she waved to me. You know, she started to offer me then something small in addition to the the cucumber. We. This is not maybe the the kind of relationship that we're always thinking about, but it added a connective thread that helped to Mm. weave me into the community because now I knew this lady and now I had a friendly face when I passed by and we established a kind of bond. She wasn't going to be my best friend. I didn't know her whole life story, but the more that you can also try to experiment in low risk ways like that, where if, if nothing had happened and she hadn't engaged with me, I wouldn't have lost anything. I think the more that you can also try 
all the time in these small ways, the more feedback and the more information you're going to get. And when you do get that smile and when it does work, that will show you that your work, it's going towards something that you aren't necessarily just stuck in place. So do you think that we show up sometimes with very high and unrealistic expectations of ourselves? We do. <laughs> I think we do. You know, I think there's this, there's a fear of being a a bad culture crosser or a bad expat, you know, nobody wants to be a bad expat. But we're Um, not afraid of being a bad tourist. (laughs) Isn't that interesting? Yeah. So I, I think it's good that we're becoming more mindful of the fact that the other communities don't just exist for us, that we need to try to understand them on their own terms and become a part of them. But what we need to remember is that there is a learning process and we spend our whole lives, those of us who who maybe grew up in, in our own culture, we were socialized along certain norms, and it's going to take us time to learn another set of norms. So what we need to yeah. do is maybe have high expectations of where we would eventually like to be, mm-hmm. but not hold ourselves to those expectations immediately and see mm-hmm. our progress kind of normalize incremental progress so that we can see that we are actually learning and growing. And sometimes to recognize that it might not feel like it. There were days, I'm sure you've had these too, Doreen, when I was living in Poland, and I would, I might just come back and I might even just like kind of collapse. I might even cry. You know, yes, I can't even think of it. It's exhausting. It's it, exhausting. It is. And, and the misunderstandings and the, the miscues and the misfires can take yes. a toll. And reminding yourself that you're not actually getting a grade for every day, but that you are making an investment in trying to do something that's really hard because you think it's worthwhile can help you to, I think, remind yourself that it's going to be a journey that's going to take Mm -hmm. time to reach. And I think that that's a a really uh, great message for all of us, especially uh, for many expats in uh, Mexico or in other cultures like Mexico, where people are seeking to build and forge these bonds through nonprofits and through NGOs of all different sorts. And for instance, here in Mexico, they're trying to get a very large project off the ground which is going to hopefully create education about the use of water. And that's a very big thing to do, to teach kids and people in another culture, because I think some of what we're dealing with with climate change is also cultural. Would you agree with that? Do we superimpose mm-hmm. our own cultures when we come? I mean, I, I feel like sometimes that's nor- that's the normal thing, and I've seen that pattern across several countries now. Um, I think we can't help but see the new place through the lens of our old place. We've developed an internal sense-making system, and that's how we see the world. So it's hard when we arrive to know if we're really seeing the local place as it is or sort of as as we are interpreting it based on our our past experiences. But I, I, I think in terms of the question about climate change, I mean, we know, you know, I'm in Los Angeles. We're also really experiencing that here. We know that it's happening around the world, but that our attitudes towards it and our responses are, I mean, we have to assume that they're shaped by culture. How, how act, what kind of active role we think we can have, Mm. how we collaborate together, how we share resources in our community. And I would say, again, with relationships, it's going to be very difficult as an outsider, I would imagine, in Mexico to say, I have a plan for all of you. (laughs) I'm here now. No, um, you can't do that. It's it's it's, it's building <laughs> it's building consensus. <laughs> right. And so I think in that case too, the relationship is the means by which you establish trust and you get mm-hmm. buy-in. And you also it's a mechanism by which you find out really important information about whether your particular idea, your particular vision is likely to succeed in that cultural environment. And so if you have the relationships at the ground level, not only are they more likely to trust you, but they're more likely to share information with you that you really need to hear so that you can make modifications. And so I think it's hard to do that in the absence of really good relationships. And so regular expats and nomads, we can build diversity and learn to live alongside each other just by doing these tiny things. Is that what you're telling us? I think that that's the, that's the way to start. You know, I think we, we all have to get started somehow. 
Yes. And starting with the low hanging fruit of the initial connections that we can try to spark with people around us. And then going from there is probably going to get us farther than if we just try to, for example, master all the nuances and complexity of Mexican society in your case overnight, in this case, having yes. very specific relationships from with people who maybe come from different walks of life mm -hmm. or who are, have different vantage points in the community that's going to be the resource that helps us understand the culture that we're in. So I would recommend that people put the relationships first rather than trying to master the culture in the abstract. No, well, that just sounds like such super down to earth. It's simple advice, but it's not necessarily easy, correct? <laughs> It isn't easy because, you know, relationships, even in our own families, can be difficult, you know, and those are people who presumably share some cultural commonalities. Not everybody in our family will always come from the same culture, but we often have something in common. And so I, I also would like to recommend to people that they not have an all or nothing mindset. You know, many of the cultures that they're moving to actually may be much more willing to tolerate some kind of frustrations than we are, because we're yes. looking for reassurance that we're doing yes. it right as an expat yes. But being yeah. open to the possibility that it might be a difficult and it might still work out, I think is important. And one of the things that Andy Malinsky and I talk about in the book is that is kind of the messages we send. And I, I wanted to mention these for your listeners. One is the message that you value the culture. You don't have yes. to be an expert on the culture, yes. but you appreciate it. <clears throat> you know, you're open to it. Another, and you do, you do that by showing curiosity, by asking yes. questions, by participating, by showing appreciation. Another signal that we send if we want to be able to have these relationships is that we value the person. The person is the actual person. You know, it's the parent at the park. It's the person that I saw who was the the vendor. It might be the, might be the neighbor that you have. Your, your own context is going to vary, but valuing that person and who they are is another signal that we can send. But the third signal is one that I think we're often a little bit hesitant about, and that's that we value ourselves. You have to figure out as an expat what that time and that place means for you. And you have to find a way to honor yourself while also honoring the culture and getting to know the other person. And I think if we recognize that, then we don't have to feel so defensive, but we also don't have to feel like we have to sacrifice ourselves in order to succeed in another environment. What we're having to constantly do is try to arrange those three mm -hmm. considerations in a productive way. And that takes a lot of experimentation and trial and error. But if we can remember that we do value ourselves, we want to value the other person and we value the culture that can often help us to kind of calibrate our approach in a way that will be productive. Well, this just seems like a wonderful note to uh, center ourselves on here. Value the culture, value the person, and also value yourself. Not necessarily in that order, correct? <laughs> no, there's no, there's no hierarchy. There's no and, you know, hierarchy. <laughs> and as you get to know the person, then you can also start to value the relationship. It's hard to value the relationship before you have one. But as yes. you get to know them, you know, you might then show that you're taking the relationship itself into account. And that's not necessarily going to tell you what to do, but it's going to tell you what kind of vein you want to be responding in. And you can ask yourself, is, or if you can ask your mentor, if I respond like this in the situation, will I be sending signals that yeah. I value the culture or that I value the other yeah. person? Or how will this affect me if I do this? And I think trying to hold on to these values in another culture can be challenging, but it also can be doable. Yes. Well, that's wonderful advice. Value yourself, value the culture, and value the person. So just to sort of wrap this up a little bit, I have a couple of fun questions for you. Okay. And this is sort of lightning round. If you were to be sentenced to some desert island for the remainder of your life, is there a local dish in the LA area where you're now living that you would want to take with you? Oh, for the rest of my life, there is. There is a large Armenian community in the LA oh. area. And the Armenian community has it has a diaspora. Yes. And from that diaspora, one of the dishes that they have at restaurants is this incredible semolina pistachio cake from oh. 
Lebanon. And this, this is one of the best things I have ever tasted. And if I had to just eat one food for the rest of my life, I think I will pick that one. Oh, that's a great answer. Thank you. And the second question is, if you were the fairy godmother to all the nomads who are um, living and exploring overseas or are living uh, or are expats living alongside another culture, what one superpower would you grant them? Oh, self-compassion. Oh, <laughs> because it's, it's wonderful to have these adventures. But it puts you in a constant state of, I think, kind of disequilibrium. You know, it's almost like the floor is like slightly slanted and you're always trying to get your balance. And being compassionate towards yourself, I think, is really important, even when you might be having a really privileged opportunity to be doing this in the first place. Just recognizing that it's hard and you're going for it, I think, can be really helpful. Thank you, Melissa. Well, this is wonderful. Now, please, can you tell our listeners... Where can they find you? And tell us a little bit about where we can find the book, please. Sure. I will put this in the show notes. Okay. So if you are on social media and you want to follow me on Instagram, you can find me at Han Cultural. It's my last name and the word cultural. I'm also on LinkedIn if you like to engage professionally. And I have a website. It is HanCultural.com. As far as the book goes, I'm not sure exactly when it is being released in every international market, but at least in the U.S. right now, you can find it on Amazon and other booksellers. Uh, many local independent bookstores have it, and you can get the Kindle version and you can get the audio book version. I've heard that in Europe, there's some delays, so I'm not sure by what the time this podcast comes out if everybody, yes. if everybody will have access, but that's where I would look for it first. Well, wonderful. Well, thank you for coming and sharing this idea of forging bonds through doing very simple, doable, practical actions on a daily basis in terms of building our cultural competencies and just our lives in general. I hope that this has been of interest and thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Doreen. It was great to be here.